What's going on everybody? So this video is Infectious Disease Part 1 for USMLE Step 2 CK. Um, in this video, I'm just going to kind of touch on um, some ID stuff that doesn't really fall into uh, very specific categories. Like I'm not going to do a systems-based approach in this video. In the future videos on ID, there'll be, um, you know, we'll do like a GU and, and so on and so forth. But I'll cover about 20% of the ID on step two in this video and then look for the next videos to have um, the remaining material. So um, I also organized the material into a three color scheme just to kind of stratify you know where you are and what you want to focus on because you know being very honest and going through the experience at one point um, it's hard to know what to focus on because there's so much material. So, um, you know, red colors here are things that you, you know, absolutely without a doubt, you need to know when you take this test. If it's a green color, you know, this, these are people that are too, you know, shooting for the 250 uh, mark and the blue teal color is more of the, you know, material you're not going to see as often, but something that is likely to, sh you know, potentially creep up on an exam and something that you might want to know if you're really shooting for a high score. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the common cold. Um, the two most common pathogens here are rhinovirus and coronavirus. Rhinovirus is the most common cause overall and coronavirus is the second most common cause. Um, rhinovirus typically replicates in the nasopharynx. Most of the other viruses that cause the common cold though, they will all replicate in the tracheobronchial uh, epithelium. Typical symptoms you'll see, uh, you know, rhinorrhea, congestion, cough, low-grade fever. Um, notice there's really not a lot of myalgias or um, things of that nature that you'll see with influenza. So this is more uh, limited to um, more of the uh, upper respiratory tract. Imaging, uh, you really don't need anything here. This is more of a clinical diagnosis. Um, but uh, if you are thinking uh, there's a pneumonia going on or there's, you know, a reason to suspect something more, you can do some imaging. So influenza um, is a uh, self-limiting infection. Usually three to 10 days is the course. It's, um, we treat it if we suspect it or if it's confirmed. Um, we want, ideally, you want to do this within 48 hours of symptom onset. Otherwise, there, the benefit to treating is uh, somewhat limited, especially an immunocompetent person. Pneumonia is the most common complication. That's particularly high yield to know that. You can have a super infection from strep pneumo, or you can have um, an, inf an infection from influenza causing an influenza pneumonia. So you start off with the, you know, your typical influenza uh, disease and that can progress. Um, adults that are at high risk. Um, so we have uh, anyone with chronic medical illness, you have you know, CHF, COPD, anything like that. Elderly patients, usually age over 65. Uh, pregnant patients are particularly at high risk. Um, and then, you know, the bimodal distribution. So we said elderly, also infants would also be at particularly high risk. Um, you have your neuraminidase inhibitors down here, so you want to know those. And those, again, can decrease illness severity and duration by two to three days. That's why, um, uh, well, we want to um, treat as soon as possible because that's when we have the, the greatest efficacy from using the neuraminidase inhibitor. So that's why it says treat all confirmed or suspected within 48 hours. So that's kind of the golden rule. You might have seen that on your rotations. Okay, strep pharyngitis, uh, group A strep. So this is strep pyogenes. Also know group A strep is beta hemolytic, something to remember from your step one study days. Um, so when you, when you see strep pharyngitis, there's kind of like this uh, diagram that you can go down with the centaur criteria that sometimes shows up. So um, a score of zero to one means you know you don't really do anything. If you have a score of two to three, you rapid strep them. If you have a, sc a score of four, you can still rapid strep them, but you also want to um, initiate empiric treatment. And so the score is something like this. So you have absence of cough is plus one, fever is plus one, uh, tender anterior cervical lymphadenopathy is plus one. Tonsillar exudates and swelling will give you a plus one. Age between three and 14 is plus one. And if you're over 45, it's minus one. Um, and the one that sometimes throws people off here is this absence of cough. So if you see a stem that says absence of cough or there is no cough, they're literally uh, probing you to use, um, you know, Centaur criteria. Because it's unusual to mention that as a pertinent negative, you know, if they're, if they're giving you a question stem. The other thing here is the ASO titers are not helpful. So um, 
the reason for that is because it takes ASO titers a little while to really kick in. Um, you know, you're not really going to see them even if you're infected with strep initially. Now, if you have um, post-strep glomerulonephritis, then we might look at these titers because at that point, the, the anti-streptolysin uh, antibodies will be elevated, but they're not going to be typically when you initially have a strep infection. Your differential diagnosis here, um, obviously the, the viral upper respiratory infection is included in here, but again, that has a cough, that has renorrhea, that has conjunctivitis, things we don't typically see here, as we said, with strep. Um, and then, you know, in, in the case that you do the rapid strep and let's say it's negative, you're still going to send it for throat culture. A lot of questions will sometimes um, maybe put you on the spot here. So, you know, what's the first test? Rapid strep. Okay, let's say it's negative. What do you do now? You do a throat culture. What if you already did a, th you know, you sent out the throat culture. Do you empirically treat? Um, and the answer is if, you know, you have to look at your central criteria. So if you have a four on your central criteria, then yeah, you probably would. If you have a high index of clinical suspicion and your rapid strep is negative, you probably should treat. And, the, and why do we treat? The reason we treat is to prevent acute rheumatic fever, post-strep glomerulonephritis. Okay, so what do we treat with? Penicillin and amoxicillin. Okay, and then that, here's a picture for your viewing pleasure of some wonderful exudates here by the tonsils. Okay, so acute rheumatic fever, um, age 5 to 15, so it's in, it's in uh, children and, and young teens. The major criteria here for acute rheumatic fever is the Jones criteria. Yeah, you definitely should know this. Um, so joints, carditis, subcutaneous nodules, erythema, marginatum, and uh, your chorea, syndem chorea. The complications here, mitral regurgitation, mitral stenosis. This is probably the most common complication. Um, and I think, and don't quote me on this, but I believe it's the number one cause of mitral regurgitation and or stenosis in um, developing countries. So that's something that you want to know. That's particularly high yield, um, that this is a complication from acute rheumatic fever. To prevent... Um, typically, uh, we use penicillin for the strep pharyngitis, like we said. Um, if you do suspect someone has acute rheumatic fever and the stem is saying that they had strep pharyngitis, they should be saying that they had strep pharyngitis about two to four weeks earlier or some kind of um, sore throat or something two to four weeks before the onset of the acute rheumatic fever symptoms. And now, I put this in here. If you have chorea and it's severe and the question is asking you, you know, what are you going to use to treat this person? It's actually corticosteroids here, okay? Um, this is kind of a tricky question because you would think, oh, do I up the antibiotics or, you know, but it's corticosteroids just to bring the inflammation down and potentially get the chorea to resolve. And then if you end up with a sequelae of pericarditis or arthritis, you just treat that like you normally would from a viral pathogen um, using NSAIDs or something like that. Okay, epiglottitis, um, abrupt onset, hot potato voice, um, you know, fever, sore throat, drooling, uh, strider, all these things that you've probably seen this one a million times, pooling of oropharynx secretions. These are all things you really want to know. Um, these are easy points on the test. Now, one thing I put in here is um, anterior neck is tender to palpation. The reason I put that in here is because there's a lot of other, um, quite in a lot of other pathologies, I should say, that um, are similar to this. Uh, or at least they try and make questions where you think it's epiglottitis and it's not. So we'll see retropharyngeal abscess. There's Ludwig's angina. There's um, you have your um, actinomyces israelii, which also causes like the sulfur granules and the, and the unilateral swelling. So there's a lot of other things that can kind of cause this presentation. Now, if it's tender to palpation, though, uh, that's going to kind of narrow your differential down a little bit and push you more towards epiglottitis. It's not going to seal the deal per se, but it's definitely going to um, make your diet, your differential a little bit more narrow. Um, the thumbprint sign on imaging, I put a picture here for your viewing pleasure. And then of course, you know, if, if, we're, if we feel that this airway is going to be compromised, we intubate, you treat this with um, ceftriaxone and vanc. Okay. Retropharyngeal abscess, um, I put uh, right after our epiglottitis, um, just to kind of compare it. So six months to six-year-olds. Now, one thing, just going back to the epiglottitis for a second, if, if you suspect someone has epiglottitis, also look in the stem um, for, you know, lack of vaccination history or something like that, because pretty much everyone now is vaccinated against Hib, 
you know, and so if you're vaccinated against him, it's unlikely you would have aquatitis. It doesn't mean you won't have it. There's still pathogens that cause it. Staph can even cause it. You know, that's part of the reason why we treat with IV bank. Um, but it's unlikely. So the question usually will say that they're not vaccinated. Now, they say that this is a vaccinated child. That might start pushing you towards this, this path of the retropharyngeal abscess here. And the reason is, is because the retropharyngeal abscess presents pretty similarly to epiglottitis. You have inability to extend the neck, um, you know, clenched teeth, muffled voice, et cetera, et cetera. All these things are very similar. Imaging is going to show you prevertebral soft tissue space that's wider than the vertebral body. So here's your vertebral bodies. Here's your soft tissue space. And you can see that it's wider than these bodies here. This is not normal. Um, the other thing is if you see a lateral cervical x-ray here, like we've seen, um, you know, we've seen one, I'll go back to the previous side here. So there's not a lot of pathology you're really going to see in a kid on a lateral cervical x-ray on step two, unless it's a retropharyngeal abscess or epiglottitis. I can't think of anything off the top of my head right now that, I mean, there might be a couple other things, but it's not common. So if you see an x-ray like this, it's, you're already, you know, okay, just, is it a retropharyngeal abscess or is it epiglottitis? That should be kind of what you're thinking about. Um, in terms of management, you know, if there's no signs of respiratory compromise, you can do a CT with contrast just to quantify the abscess, see how big it is, is there more than one, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if there is respiratory comp compromise, it makes your life easy, just intubate. Okay. All right, pertussis, um, transmitted by respiratory droplets. Um, so this is more of a step one thing here, this next bullet. So b the bacteria colonize the mucosal surface. The pertussis toxin binds, activates, and adenylates cyclase. So I'm really taking you back to step one here. And it does that by inhibiting GI. So remember, GI is an inhibitor for the adenylate cyclase, and you're inhibiting the inhibitor with pertussis, and that impairs phagocytosis so that the pertussis bacteria can proliferate. Now, is that high yield? Probably not, but a lot of step two questions will take things you know, an extra step and sometimes test your step one knowledge. So it's not a bad thing just to kind of have that in the brain somewhere. Um, the other thing is, um, this is particular high yield, is this inspiratory whoop. That will, that will give the question away. Also note that that inspiratory whoop takes place in the paroxysmal stage. So you have three stages of pertussis. The first couple of weeks is this first cataral stage. I'm not sure. I probably didn't pronounce that right. Um, so I apologize for that. The paroxysmal stage is the mid stage. That's like four to six weeks into the illness, um, or I should say six to eight weeks or so into the illness, you're going to have um, mo more of these um, paroxysmal symptoms like the whoop. And then you have this post tussive emesis. So, you know, you're throwing up because you're coughing so hard and you could be coughing so hard that you might, um, you might have like a, um, some hyperemia, um, like a little bit of a conjunctival bleeding, that kind of thing. Um, you might have um, even like a pneumothorax if the kid is very young. There's a lot of complications and in a lot of ways they can spin a test question to kind of see if you know that this all this extra pressure from this constant coughing is causing some additional signs and symptoms in your patient. Um, the other thing is th that pertussis is very deadly in infants, so it can cause apnea, cyanosis, so um, that's also particularly high yield to know. Now you're going to have a lymphocyte predominant leukocytosis. Um, so that's something else. Now, I don't know if that'll clinch the diagnosis per se for you, but it's something to keep in mind. You diagnose it by PCR, serology. Um, there's also going back to step one, there's cultures on the Bordet Django agar. I didn't pronounce that right either. I apologize. Uh, and then you have a a Reagan low medium. Now, again, those things are not particularly high yield, but again, something good just to kind of keep in the back of the head, um, you know, if you see that in a question. They, when you do these labs, you can't um, get your, you can't swab them with cotton. So you have to use specific swabs. So it's another kind of thing to know. Now, back to the high yield stuff, what do you treat it with? Macrolides. So um, keep that in mind. Erythromycin is is and you'll hear me probably say this over and over again erythromycin in questions they don't prefer it it's kind of the same thing with ceftriaxone they don't prefer ceftriaxone um, they don't prefer erythromycin because of pyloric stenosis they don't prefer ceftriaxone because of cernicterus you know these are more academic things but still something to note when you're when you're going to question so if you have to pick between erythromycin and azithromycin in a 
two month old, you're going to go azithromycin, right? If you have to pick between ceftriaxone and, you know, an alternative, ceftriaxime or something, you're going to go with the alternative, right? You're not going to use ceftriaxone. So that's something else kind of high yield to know. Um, so in terms of prevention, you have DTAP, Tdap, um, two, four, six months, 15 to 18 months, and four to six years for the DTAP, and you get a booster in adolescence. Um, and then you also get each pregnancy, you'll get uh, Tdap, um, and then your TD you get every 10 years. So this is just a little bit of the immunization stuff I put in there. Um, close contacts should receive antibiotics. It doesn't matter if they've been immunized. You could have received your Tdap, you know, two days ago. You still uh, give the close contacts antibiotic macrolides. Um, and if they need any vaccinations, if they haven't gotten their, you know, Tdap or TD, whatever it is, in 10 years, you give them that too while they're there. But you still treat with antibiotics prophylactically. Okay, sinusitis, most common predisposing factor is previous viral URI. Most common bugs for sinusitis, titus media, I mean, you know, everything up there, when in doubt, strip pneumo, non-typable haemophilus, and more excellent. Now, why did I put non-typable haemophilus? That's because the non-typable haemophilus is um, not the kind you get vaccinated against. You get vaccinated against Hib, which is for epiglottitis. So you, just because you've been vaccinated against Hib, you still are prone to the non-typable haemophilus influenza, uh, excuse me, um, yeah, it's the non-typable haemophilus infections. Okay, most common site for sinusitis is the maxillary sinus. Again, more of a step one thing. I have seen this in um, some question banks. The diagnosis is clinical. Um, you know, you don't really want to be shooting people with CTs. Now, when would you get a CT? Well, if you suspect orbital cellulitis, let's say they can't move their eyes left to right. Or let's say they have cranial nerve deficits in, you know, 3, 4, V1, V2, and 6. So now you're thinking cavernous sinus thrombosis, right? So um, th in those cases, yeah, absolutely. Get the CT, let's see what's going on. How do you treat sinusitis? Amoxicillin clavulanic acid. Got to know that. That's very high yield. Okay. Tuberculosis. So I'm not going to cover all of tuberculosis here. What I am going to cover, um, and, and the reason I'm not, is because it's going to be, when I cover pneumonias and all that stuff, we'll talk about tuberculosis um, pathology a little bit more. In this video, I just wanted to kind of group this in because I don't really have a place for it. Uh, PPD, you know, um, and then what do you use to treat it, and then we'll talk about this again. So just a little bit on TB here. For the PPD test, you have your 5, 10, 15, okay? Now, there's more things that go in there. I didn't include everything, but I just kind of put the things that show up the most. So for, if you have a five millimeter or greater PPD and, and you want to call a positive, it has to be someone immunosuppressed. If you just remember immunosuppressed, you can pretty much get most of this category, which includes HIV, organ transplants, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. 10 millimeters or more to be positive is going to be um, drug users, immigrants, and then one that comes up a lot is like nursing staff, doctors. Um, you can, this can also include like prison workers, anything like that. Anybody that's at high risk. 15 millimeters or more is just, you know, anybody that doesn't fall into the 5 and 10. Generally, these are healthy people, low risk. When you do a PPD, you're initially going to do your injection for your PPD, and then you measure it 48 to 72 hours later. Okay. The interferon gamma release assay is the, the uh, serological option. Um, people that have had like BCG vaccines and stuff, we tend to want to do the interferon gamma release assay to kind of eliminate some of the false positives. More on that in a future video. In terms of treatment, you have latent and active. If you have latent TB, you go with your isoniazid and rifampin. I think you can also use rif uh, rifampin. Um, plus or minus pyridoxin for three months. So recall pyridoxin is your vitamin B6. Why do you give vitamin B6? Because isoniazide I can cause the vitamin B6 deficiency. So the things you have to remember here is the pyridoxin for B6 and then that you're going to use these two drugs, these are your two core drugs for three months. Okay. Another thing to kind of remember, and I'm just throwing this in here, just to plug in here, um, is that rifampin is a CYP450 inducer. Okay. So you have like your rifampin, your um, ginseng, um, all your anti-epileptics, um, and I think I'm missing a couple, but those those are the big ones, um, and rifampin is one of those. So it's something to keep in mind, and then it also gives you those orange secretions, isoniazide, vitamin B6 deficiency, liver toxicity, right? Those are the things you have to know. 
Now, sorry for the sidetrack. I'm just trying to give you everything I got. So active treatment for TB, you're going to use those two core drugs again, but now you're going to include the ethambutol and pyrazinamide. You're going to do those four for two months, followed by your core isoniazid and rifampin for an additional four months. And this whole time you can give them pyridoxin. You definitely want to give pyridoxin if it's somebody that has like, you know, alcohol abuse or immunodeficiency or something like that. Those are the people you really, really want to make sure you're giving the pyridoxin to. Um, what else? And then ethambutol causes, I think it's like an optic neuritis um, or vision color changes. I'll have, to look, I'll have that one included in my uh, antimicrobial drug video. But anyway, for this video, just some things to note about some of these drugs. Okay, uh, moving. So infective endocarditis. So I always used to confuse this. Acute rheumatic fever, you can use the Jones as the major criteria. Infective endocarditis, you use the modified Duke criteria, which um, I, I don't think is as important as the Jones criteria for the test, but it's just basically the, the major criteria is basically like your blood cultures and your, and your echo. Um, so let's talk about the clinical findings here which I think are, are kind of important. So um, fever, heart murmur, petechiae, the ossular nodes are those painful nodes on the hand, the Janeway lesions are the non-painful ones, then you have your Roth spots. You really don't see the Roth spots in many patients. I think it was like 5% of patients have Roth spots. So that's why I don't think it's as high yield to know the Roth spots. Um, the splinter hemorrhages, definitely want to know that. Sometimes I'll just show you a picture of a uh, fingernail and you might see some uh, splinter hemorrhages on there. Um, splenomegaly, and then embolic phenomena is huge. I feel like there's so many questions that have something related to embolic phenomena with a, a left-sided infective endocarditis. So we'll talk about some of that too in just a minute. Um, the most common valve abnormality here, again, we're back to the mitral valve, mitral valve prolapse and mitral regurgitation. Now this aortic valve is the second most common valve involved. Um, the diagnosis requires a minimum of three blood cultures obtained from separate venipuncture sites prior to antibiotic therapy. There's some exceptions to this, there's some other rules, but just as a general thing, it's, it wouldn't hurt to kind of know that. Um, the gold standard for diagnosing this is a TEE. Now, one thing to note, and this confuses people sometimes too, if you're looking at the valves, you want to kind of get up closer, so you want to get through the esophagus so you can see the valves better. So that's why you do a TEE. It's not a transthoracic echocardiogram. It's a transesophageal echocardiogram when you're looking at the valves. So please remember that. This is also something I'll talk about when we talk about any kind of aortic uh, disease. You're going to want to go TEE. Okay. What do you treat this with? Empiric vancomycin is the treatment of choice. Um, and that's just because you want to cover your most common pathogens. You can change this once your cultures come back. You know, if you have viridins, you're going to switch to like penicillin or something. Okay. Complications. Um, again, embolic phenomena is huge. So um, you can get an embolic stroke, which is, a, you know, if it's left-sided, this is something you might see. The only other time you'll see an embolic stroke is like if you have like an ASD or a Peyton Freeman ovale because the actual um, clot has to, or the thrombus clot should, has to travel to the left side of the heart to get pumped out. Um, other things you might see, this is for the, those 270 people out there, renal infarction and perivalvular abscess. So, you know, you see one of these in a, in a test question, you'd be really confused. Like, okay, well, why, what's up with the kidneys? I thought this was infective endocarditis or I might have suspected it. I don't understand why the creatinine just shot up and et cetera, et cetera. So um, those are things to keep in mind. Think of what you would see with renal infarction. Think of what you would see with a perivalvular abscess. What would you be expecting? Perivalvular abscess, maybe an AV block. Renal infarction, creatinine is going to gonna shoot up. You're going to have um, either, it could be a pre-renal picture or you can have a, um, ATN or something like that. So these are things to kind of think about and put the whole picture together for those questions where only 30% of people are getting them right. Okay, so infective endocarditis. Um, the other thing about this, and I, I didn't highlight this page, but I'll do it now. So um, IV drug users, okay, that's this is a big thing with infective endocarditis. So if it's an IV drug user, the game changes a little bit. So Staph aureus, got to know this. I'll put it in red here for you. Staph aureus, most common pathogen. Where is it going to be? Well, it's going to be most likely the tricuspid valve. It's very different from what we've talked about so far. And recall that the tricuspid valve will give you a holosystolic murmur, uh, similar to mitral regurg. But guess what? It's not at the apex, right? It's 
going to be around the left sternal border. It's going to increase with inspiration, whereas mitral regurgitation will increase with expiration. So this is going to point you down to the tricuspid uh, valve. Okay. Now, we just said embolic phenomena is huge. In this case, because it's on the um, uh, right side of the heart, the unless there's an ASD or PFO, it's going to go into the lungs, right? So you can end up with PE type symptoms. What are symptoms of PE? Right bundle branch block, sinus tack, pleuritic chest pain, maybe some hemoptysis, VQ shunt, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? You got to put those pieces together to start to figure this out. All right. Um, heart failure is more common with aortic valve involvement, rare with tricuspid valve involvement. So there's that. Okay. Um, infective endocarditis. Now here, what I did is I just kind of put together a picture and um, I used a little bit of a couple of resources. Um, UWorld was one of them to put this together just to give you an idea of what's associated with what when you have to pick the pathogen. So Staph aureus, just think most, you know, most common. This is my go-to guy. Um, and because Staph aureus has Staph in it, and you know Staph epidermitis is usually with catheters and prosthetic valves, that's also where you will find Staph aureus. You'll also see Staph aureus with IV drug users at what valve? Tricuspid valve. Viridins, on the other hand, you'll see this a lot when you'll have any kind of dental manipulation, such as dental procedures. Now, the thing for my 270 people out there, respiratory tract incisions and biopsies, I can totally see them switching things up and saying, hey, this guy's got lung cancer. He just went in for a biopsy of this solitary pulmonary nodule, and now he has endocarditis symptoms. You know, what is the most likely pathogen? Viridins, right? That's a tough question, but know this, because it's easy to just think Viridins dental procedures, but know this respiratory tract part too. I, I just have this weird gut feeling like that's going to like show up somewhere. I could be completely wrong about that. Okay, staph epidermitis, we already talked about enterococci, UTIs, you're going to see this. You know, 250 people, you're definitely going to see this. You got to know this. Um, Galoliticus and bovis, colon cancer, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, that's, this is something that, you know, everybody should know. You, you should know this one for sure. This is particularly high yield also. Okay, so then we have fungi. So anybody that's been on antibiotics for like a prolonged course, maybe they had like a, um, you know, a really bad sinus infection. I don't know. Somebody that's been on antibiotics for a long time, you want to start thinking of potential candida species or that kind of thing. If they've had a central line in for a long time and they've been getting antibiotics, now you're knocking off two of these. Maybe they're also immunocompromised. Now you're really okay. Now you're opening up the door for fungi, although this is ra a rather rare cause. Only 3% of infective endocarditis is going to actually be in this HASIC column, which is also pretty rare. These are culture negative, okay? So they're not going to grow. So I kind of confuse you a little bit when the cultures are negative. Um, and I would also actually not be able to, you know, write down all the names of all these guys. But know the first and last general name of each one of these HASIC groups because sometimes the question will come up and it will be like, you know, culture negative endocarditis, which one is it? And you'll see like two or three different of these Haemophilus. And you have to know that it's Haemophilus afrophilus or whatever, you know. So just kind of know these general names. This one, I should have made this a color. Let's make this green because it's kind of right in that middle. Eichenolocorodens causes uh, this culture negative infective endocarditis and if you had to know one of these five that's the one i tell you to know because this one's associated with poor dentition so let's say you have an alcoholic and they get an infective endocarditis and it's you know they don't tell you that it's culture negative but they're like well which one is the most likely cause and let's say you know they don't have i guess if staph aureus wasn't included because you might think staph aureus right as your number one cause but let's say that staph aureus wasn't there and they put viridins there and they, you know, had these four, and then you had Iconella corrodens. Well, you'd have to know that Iconella corrodens is associated with poor dentition, whereas Viridens is associated with dental procedures. It's kind of confusing. So just keep that in mind. Liebman Sachs endocarditis, I included in here, you're probably saying, well, this is an ID video. Liebman Sachs endocarditis, as you know, is not associated with an infectious pathology. Rather, it's a more rheumatologic condition, but I put it in here just so you can, for completeness, um, culture negative, just like your HACE groups associated with lupus, right? Okay. Splenic abscess, again, this goes back to our embolic phenomena. So an immunosuppressed patient or IV drug user, 
Um, maybe they have infective endocarditis or maybe they're just getting over it. And now they're presenting with you know high fever, left upper quadrant pain, leukocytosis. There's not a lot of things that are going to give you left upper quadrant pain. Splenic abscess is one of them. Anything with the spleen really is one of them. Um, so left-sided pleural chest pain, left pleural effusion uh, treatment, you got to take the spleen out. Antibiotics aren't going to do it. So especially if that thing ruptures, you're going to have a, a world of hurt on your hands. So you got to take the spleen out. And this is um, this is pretty high risk. I mean, 10 to 20 percent risk with left-sided infective endocarditis. You know, that's like it's like one in six, one in five. I mean, that's that's pretty high. So keep this in mind. Toxic shock syndrome, um, TSST1 toxin of Staph aureus. It can also be from uh, strep pyogenes, this erythrogenic exotoxin A. Both of them cause um, T cell activation, and it leads, um, and they do this by cross-linking, and they act like a super antigen, so it activates all these T cells. It's more necrotizing with the uh, group A strep. With the Staph aureus, it's more of like a, you know, your skin's going to peel and that kind of thing. In both cases, you'll probably have a hypotense uh, patient. So that's something to look for is the hypotension. You might also see thrombocytopenia, fever, associated with tampon use, nasal packing, particularly Staph. If you have a patient that has a tampon, they don't, you know, they're, they're trying to get you to distinguish if it's Staph or if it's group A strep. If you if it's if it's like a tampon that's been in there for a while and, and you know, you're pretty sure it's toxic shock syndrome, you got to go Staph. That's more common. And uh, treatment fluids, removal of the foreign body, broad spectrum, anti staph antibiotics. Okay, we're almost done here. Um, Ehrlichia, this is really a zebra out there. And it's, it's, it's a tough one because you're, you're going to have a tough time just going to this. But if you see in the, in the answer choices or in the options, um, you want to at least understand what you're looking for. So Lone Star Tick. Uh, Ambulomia americanum. This is going to be southeastern U.S. The reservoir is the white-tailed deer. Probably don't have to know the reservoir, but I would know the tick. I would definitely, definitely know that it's southeastern U.S. They start telling you you have a patient, a patient in Oklahoma, Arkansas, you know, Arizona. You're thinking two things. You're thinking this, and what's the other thing you're thinking about? Coccidiomycosis, right? If they go out of their way to tell you that, you've pretty much narrowed it down to two things. Now, they could do that to throw you off the, the chase a little bit, but that's more unlikely. Okay, clinical findings. Um, confusion, altered mental status is a big one. If you see that, it kind of it should kind of push you down this road. It's also known as Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever without the spots, and that's because you have like this flu-like illness. You'll have a leukopenia, which is very important because those are the cells that are involved. The thrombocytopenia might have some elevated liver enzymes and increase in LDH. None of this stuff really, though, is going to be enough to really pinpoint you on they're gonna to have to give you something okay it might be the leukopenia it might be this smear here with these dots inside of the monocytes those are known as morulae intracytoplasmic morulae in the monocytes but they're gonna to have to give you something um, you diagnose it on PCR and when in doubt doxy right when in doubt doxy okay all right, lymphadenitis, um, enlarged lymph node, it's tender, it's erythematous, right? If it's non-tender, it's fixed, then you're going to think more of a cancer, malignancy, something like that. In this case, it's very tender, and they're enlarged. Very common in children. We split it up into two categories, unilateral and bilateral. Unilateral is much more of a diverse differential here, at least for this test. Bilateral is going to be a little bit simpler. So uni unilateral, most common, you're going to be staph strep right if they have really bad dentition you're thinking anaerobes um prevotella peptostreptococcus if it's been there four weeks six weeks it's non-tender maybe it's got like a purplish color valacious color over the lymph node now you're thinking mac mycobacterium avium okay you don't have to be immunocompromised to get mycobacterium avium lymphadenitis this is different from the MAC you get with a CD4 uh, cell count of less than 50. Not the same thing. Bartonella, cat scratch, or bite. So remember that cat scratch disease. So that This will give you more of like a papular lymph node. Tularemia is your rabbits, your hamsters, your blood-sucking arthropods, zoonosis, 
So that's tularemia, okay? This is much less likely to be asked about, but again, for tularemia, for Bartonella, they got to give you something, right? They got to tell you that guy's got a cat or he was just around, you know, just got a pet hamster or he was just hunting rabbits or, you know what I mean? It's got to be something obvious that at least points you in this direction. And again, sometimes they say these things, they say that person has a cat, and, th and, you know, then there's nothing else that indicates that the disease has anything to do with Bartonella. So you got to kind of put it all together. But that, like I said, they're going to have to give you something for you to even go down this road. If it's bilateral lymphadenitis, um, adenovirus causes that pharyngeal conjunctival fever, right? Sore throat, you have that conjunctivitis, you have a fever, and you might have some enlarged tender lymph nodes. Um, and then Epstein-Barr and CMV, your mononucleosis, right? That will also give you tender lymph nodes bilaterally. How do you treat it? Particularly if it's unilateral, you give them clindamycin. Why? Well, you got to look at your most common bugs again. So MRSA potentially, strep pyogenes, use clinda, right? Clinda covers MRSA. This is my last slide. So Lyme disease, um, this is a busy slide. So there's your erythema migrans rash picture there for your viewing pleasure. Exoides scapularis. Now, before I go any farther, what else causes exoides scapularis? There's three, uh, excuse me, let me let me rephrase that question so I can say it in English. Um, what other diseases, or I should say pathogens, are transmitted by exoides scapularis ticks? That would be anaplasmosis and Babesia. So um, know that because I've I've also seen that come up, especially for, you know, if you're shooting 250 plus. Okay, back to the slide. So, Exoides scapularis is the tick. Uh, Wisconsin is the home state, but really, it could be any northeastern coastal state, Minnesota, Illinois, um, all in that region, Michigan, in that region. So, that's what you're looking for. Um, the Early localized disease, you're going to have the erythema migrans rash. You'll get that within a, a day of tick bite. Um, you got to know what that rash looks like, and you have to be able to differentiate it from a lot of your other dermatologic rashes. Um, also, they could describe the rash, and target lesion, that kind of thing. Treatment, oral doxycycline for your non-pregnants and eight or older. If they're less than eight, you do oral amoxicillin. You can also use cefuroxime. Um, if they're pregnant, same thing, oral amoxicillin. Um, so that's when you just have the rash. If they've had a rash in the past, they were never really treated, they never went in, and now they have a migratory arthritis, which um, you also see this in acute rheumatic fever. You can also see this with gonococcal arthritis um, or gonococcal disease. So if they have a migratory arthritis or they have joint pain kind of in different areas at different times, then maybe they have some cranial nerve deficits, particularly the bilateral facial nerve palsy. For you 270 folks, if you have a bilateral facial nerve palsy, that should be that should immediately point you down the Lyme disease road um, on your differential. Carditis and then third degree AV block. I feel like everybody knows third degree AV block with Lyme disease, and if you don't, that's totally cool, but, but know it now. And... Uh, what do you treat it with? IV ceftriaxone. You don't use doxy here, okay, guys? If you got somebody with bilateral facial nerve palsy and you're really high suspicion for Lyme, you do serology and have Lyme, don't pick oral doxycycline. It's IV ceftriaxone. You also use IV ceftriaxone if it's this late or chronic stage where you have like encephalomyelitis, peripheral neuropathy, or arthritis. Just think it's more severe. You gotta use something a little stronger. Um, the other thing is sometimes on questions, they will, you know, you'll see this rash and they'll say, what's the next step? And one of the options might be serology or like, you know, Lyme, IgM, IgG, whatever. Um, you don't do that. And that's because it takes a little while for those things to kick in. If it's, a dis if it's disseminated and you have these symptoms or if it's later chronic and you have these symptoms, then yeah, you, can t you definitely want to do serology. When you have this rash, that's enough. You can diagnose it right off of here and you can start treatment. Okay. Hopefully this video helped you. Um, and I'll work on getting another one out. Uh, for you guys and uh, please if you want me to tweak anything if you don't like something I'm doing let me know and I would be happy to try and accommodate you um, and good luck studying thank you for watching